I scored 1590 on the SAT, and in this video, I'll be doing a walkthrough of digital SAT practice test one's reading and writing sections. With that being said, make sure to like and subscribe, and let's go and get started with question one. Former astronaut Ellen Ochoa says that although she doesn't have a definite idea of when it might happen, she blank humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. I'll go ahead and fill that in with believes. This conjecture informs her interest in future research missions to the moon. Okay, so whenever you have a blank like this, what I recommend to do is try to fill it in as you read and then take a look at your answer choices after that. So we have which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase. Okay, in this case, I had she believes humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. We have demands. Well, she can't demand that. Uh, she could speculate that. She doesn't doubt it. She believes it. Uh, she doesn't establish this. That would be something like she proves. She hasn't proven it, so she does speculate. Okay, so here's question two. We have beginning in the 1950s, Navajo Nation legislator Annie Dodge Waneka uh, continuously worked to promote public health. This blank effort involved traveling throughout the vast Navajo homeland and writing a medical dictionary for speakers of uh, this, the Navajo language, I would say this is a diligent effort um, or something along those lines. We have option A, uh, an impartial effort. Well, you're not really taking sides here, so that doesn't really make sense. We have offhand, that would be a negative connotation, so that doesn't make sense. Persistent effort would make sense since it says she continuously worked to do it, and that's pretty similar to diligent. Uh, mandatory, no one's forcing her, so our answer would have to be C. All right, so we've got following the principles of community-based participatory research tribal nations and research institutions are equal partners in health studies conducted on reservations. A collaboration between the Crow Tribe and Montana State University blank this model. Tribal citizens worked alongside scientists to design the methodology and continue to assist in data collection. Okay, so this is an example. So we could say that the collaboration um, exemplifies this model. So something dealing with an example exemplifies would work perfectly. We've got options. Uh, which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase? Circumvents, that doesn't make sense because we're providing an example of this collaboration. Eclipses wouldn't make sense. Fabricates wouldn't make sense. Exemplifies is perfect. So we've got D. We can go ahead and move on to question at number four. That's a pretty common case um, on the SAT reading and writing that you'll get something that's an example of something. A parasitic daughter plant increases its reproductive success by flowering at the same time as the host plant it latched onto. Uh, and then in 2020, Zhang Wang Wu and his colleagues determined that the tiny daughter achieves this blank with its host by rubbing and utilizing a protein the host produces when it's about to flower. So this is really all about the timing of the flowering, it looks like, and the fact that this parasite um, is able to have reproductive success by flowering at the same time. So it achieves this, uh, probably something to do with uh, timing. Okay, so it achieves this timing. So we've got option A, uh, or which choice, once again, completes text, most logical and precise word or phrase. Synchronization would make the most sense here. Uh, B, hibernation, nothing to do with that prediction, nothing to do with that moderation, nothing to do with that. This has to completely do with timing, the fact that they flower at the same time. Uh, so synchronization would be perfect there. Given that the conditions in binary star systems should make the planetary formation nearly impossible. Okay, so this should be nearly impossible. It's not surprising that the existence of planets in such system has lacked blank explanation. I would say sufficient explanation would make sense there or something along those lines. Uh, Roman, Rafikov, and Kidron Silsby shed light on the subject when they use modeling to determine a complex set of factors that could support planet's development. Yeah, sufficient seems like it'd be good there. We've got which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase. Uh, discernible. So discernible would be something that's sort of noticeable, has lacked a noticeable explanation. I wouldn't really say noticeable would make the most sense. We have option B is straightforward. That would make sense. It would lack a simplistic explanation. And that goes along with the fact that it says that um, they use modeling to determine a complex set of factors that could support the development. So there is no straightforward explanation. Um, so that makes much more sense than even um, sufficient would or discernible would. Um, so we can get rid of A. If you look at C, an inconclusive um, explanation has lacked an inconclusive explanation. Well, it should be it has lacked a conclusive explanation if we were going to do any of those or if we were going to use the word conclusive. And then we have an unbiased. Um, we're not dealing with any sort of biases here. We're really just stating that it's a complex set of factors that support plans development. Therefore, it lacks a straightforward definition. Our explanation would make the most sense there. Uh, number six, Seminole Muskogee director Sterling Harho, blank television, television's tendency to situate native characters in the distant past. This rejection. Okay, so he's rejecting something. So uh, we could say Sterling Har Harho's television's tendency, seminal director, something to deal with basically rejection is basically what we're looking for there. Uh, is evident in his series Reservation Dogs, which revolves around teenagers who dress in contemporary styles and whose dialogue is laced with current slang, which choice completes the text of the most logical and precise word or phrase. We've option A, repudiate, which basically means to reject essentially. So that's probably going to be the best option. We can go ahead and take a look at B. Proclaims wouldn't make sense because he's rejecting 
the tendency to situate native characters in the distant past, because obviously he's saying that they dress in contemporary styles in his works. It's laced with current slang. So uh, clearly a rejection foretells wouldn't make sense. Recants would basically be to like think about recanting someone's testimony. Um, they no longer believe um, what they said in the past. So that wouldn't make sense. Repudiate would be perfect there. Uh, he's rejecting television's tendency. In 2007, a computer scientist, Louis von Ahn, was working on converting uh, printed books into a digital format. He found that some of the words were distorted enough that digital scanners couldn't recognize them, but most humans could easily read them. Based on that finding, von Ahn invented a simple security test to keep automated bots out of websites. First version of the recapture test asked users to type one known word in one of the many word scanners couldn't recognize. Current answers proved the users were humans and added data to the book digitizing digitizing project which choice best states the main purpose of the text well it's basically just talking about the recapture discovery and sort of how it came about and then um looks like we also touch on uh, i'm not sure we touched too much on the usage ask users to type one word yeah so pretty much just the discovery of recapture so we got option a to discuss uh the invention of recapture that would make sense alongside discovery we've got option b explain how digital scanners work no call attention to the digitizing project no to indicate how popular recapture is no basically just talking about the discovery of recapture so invention would work fine there the following text is from edith wharton's 1905 novel the house of mirth Lily Bart and a companion are walking through a park. Lily had no real intimacy with nature, but she had a passion for the appropriate and could be keenly sensitive to a scene which was the fitting background of her own sensations. The landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breath, and its long, free reaches. Okay, so we see that that's an example of what we said previously, where uh, it says she was keenly sensitive to a scene. Um, then we're talking about um, sort of basically using uh, some very descriptive language to talk about how sensitive she is to her surroundings. Um, so we got next sentence would be on the rear, nearer slopes, the sugar maples wavered like pyres of light. Lower down was a massing of gray orchards and here the lingering green of an oak grove. That's kind of just sort of continuing that description a little bit, sounds like. Um, we got which choice best describes the function of the underlying text and uh, underlying sentence in the text as a whole. So like I kind of said, we're basically just supporting that claim that came in the previous sentence that she's sensitive uh, to the scenes around her, which is fitting of the background uh, of her own sensation. So we've got option A, it creates a detailed image of the physical setting of the scene. Not really, it's really just kind of supporting the claim that came previously. We've got B, establishes that a character is experiencing an internal conflict. There's not really an internal conflict going on. Makes an assertion, makes an assertion that the next sentence expands on. Yes, that makes sense. It's basically making a claim or an assertion. The next sentence then supports or expands on. That makes sense. Then D, illustrates an idea that's produced uh, illustrates an idea that is introduced in the previous sentence. Okay, so we need to kind of roll back. These two both are sort of similar C and D, so let's kind of narrow these down. Uh, makes an assertion that the next sentence expands on. Let's see if there's an assertion here. So we've got uh, keenly, she had a passion for the appropriate and could be keenly sensitive to a scene, which was the fitting background of her own sensations. Okay, and then we have the landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breath, its long free reaches. Okay, that's not really supporting um, that's not really any sort of, it's not really any expansion on what came before it. It's an illustration of what came before it. Okay. We are illustrating the fact that she is sensitive to the scene. We're illustrating that, but we're not expanding on that claim. Okay. So expanding on is the part that's wrong there. We can get rid of this. Okay. X that out. It's illustrating an idea that's introduced in the previous sentence. That's perfect. Okay. So uh, one thing you want to recognize on the reading and writing section of the SAT is even if we'll, even if 80% of an answer choice is right, if 20% of it is wrong, then the whole answer choice is wrong. So in this case, you know, it talks about illustrating an idea versus making an assertion. Those two things can be kind of similar, but ultimately we don't expand on what came before it. Okay, we are illustrating the idea that's introduced in the previous sentence. We're not expanding on it. So uh, expands on is what makes C wrong. So always make sure you're looking for um, ways to get rid of wrong answer choices on the, the digital SAT um, and the paper SAT reading and writing section. You wanna make sure that you are looking for, you know, how to eliminate wrong answer choices because that can help you get to your right answer. So we have number nine now. A study by a team, including finance professor Madhu, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Suggests that exposure to sunshine during the workday can lead to overly optimistic behavior. Okay, so that's a claim right there. I'll mark that with a C. Using data spanning from 1994 to 2010 for a set of U.S. companies, the team compared over 29,000 annual earnings forecasts to the actual earnings later reported by those companies. Okay, so this is basically describing what the data is. Uh, the team found that the greater the exposure to sunshine at work in the two weeks before a manager submitted an earnings forecast, the more the manager's forecast exceeded what the company actually earned that year. So this is pretty much our conclusion based on the data. Um, and then this is like the data here. So we got which choice best or not necessarily, this isn't necessarily the data. This is how they are collecting the data, right? They are taking it from, you know, 
this many earnings reports from a set of you know these companies. So we've got option uh, which choice best states the function of the underlying sentence and the overall structure of the text. Option A to summarize the results of the team's analysis. There's no results. We're talking about how they collected the data. Uh, we've got B, present a specific example that illustrates the study's findings. We're not presenting a specific example that illustrates findings we have to explain part of the methodology used in the team studies. That would make sense, the methodology here being how they collected the data. And then we have D, uh, to call out a challenge the team faced in conducting its analysis. No, we're talking about how they collected the data, or in other words, explaining part of the methodology used in the study. So C would work perfectly there. Number 10 now, following text is adapted from Edith Nesbitt's 1906 novel, The Railway Children. Mother did not spend all her time playing, paying dull visits to dull ladies and sitting dully at home waiting for dull ladies to pay visits to her. Anything repeated that much, pay attention to. She all was almost always there, ready to play with the children and read to them and help them to do their home lessons. Besides this, she used to write stories for them while they were at school and read them aloud after tea. And she always made up funny pieces of poetry for their birthdays and for other great occasions. According to the text, what's true about mother, basically from what it sounds like, she cares a ton about her kids. Um, it doesn't really care about um, sort of, you know, this, any sort of gossip or drama going on with other ladies in the town. We've got option A, she wishes that more ladies would visit her. There's no support for that. B, birthdays are her favorite special occasion. They're not saying it's her favorite. That's the part that would get rid of B. She creates stories and poems for the children. That is supported by the text. D, reading to her children is her favorite activity. Once again, I don't think it says anything is her favorite there. So we can get rid of B and D based on the favorite parts. C would have to be our answer there. We have the following text is from Maggie Pogues Johnson. Maggie Pogue Johnson's 1910 poem, Poet of Our Race, and the poem the speaker's addressing Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a black author, though with the mighty stroke of my though with stroke of mighty pen has told of joy and mirth and read the hearts and souls of men as cradled from their birth the language of the flowers thou hast read them all and e'en the little brook responded to thy call all right so we've got which choice best states the main purpose of the text option a to praise a certain writer for being especially perceptive regarding people in nature uh, that would make sense read the hearts and souls of men so talking about people there and then we move on to the language of the flowers talking about how they've read all the language of the flowers so very perceptive to people and nature so that would make a lot of sense we've got b uh, to establish that a certain writer has read extensive extensively about certain about a variety of topics we don't say that they read extensively c call attention to a certain writer's careful and elegantly detailed writing process we're not talking about a writing process and then we've got option d to recount fond memories of an afternoon spent in nature with a certain writer nowhere does it say that they are spending this time together so our answer has got to be a to you is a 1856 poem by Walt Whitman. In the poem, Whitman suggests that readers whom he addresses directly have not fully understood themselves, writing which quotation from To You most effectively illustrates this claim. The claim being that the writers who he's addressing directly, so we have to make sure he does address them directly, have not yet fully or have not fully understood themselves. Okay, so we've got option A, you have not known what you are. That is pretty much explicitly stating that they don't know what they are, they don't understand themselves. So that looks good so far. You've slumbered upon yourself all your life, your eyelids have been the same as closed most of the time. That makes a lot of sense. So we can go and put a check mark next to A. If we look at B, these immense meadows, these interminable rivers, you are immense and interminable as they. That doesn't make any sense for talking about people who don't understand themselves. We got C, I should have made my way straight to you long ago. I should have blabbed nothing but you. I should have chanted nothing but you. That doesn't make sense. D, I will leave all and come and make the hymns of you. None has understood you, but I understand you. Okay, so when he says none has understood you here, that isn't necessarily saying that the person hasn't understood themselves. Um, for example, if I was to say to someone, uh, no one understands you, that person probably wouldn't insinuate that they don't understand themselves. They would probably just insinuate that I think that no one else around them understands them. So D, um, I'm gonna get rid of that one as well based on that, because this is pretty much just understanding um, what sort of this would mean in the context of a poem. So, and also he's direct addressing this person directly and like i said if i addressed someone directly and said no one has understood you the person would not interpret that to mean that they don't understand themselves okay a is perfect here it's very explicit you've not known what you are okay you don't understand yourself you've slumbered upon yourself a is completely explicit um, and would directly support that claim so we can go with a for number 12 let's go ahead and move on to question number 13 we have born in 1891 to a, a blank speaking family in the Andes mountains of Peru. Martin Chambi is today considered to be one of the most renowned figures of Latin America photography. And a paper for an art history class, a student claims that Chambi's photographs have considerable ethnographic value and his work Chambi was able to capture diverse elements of Peruvian society representing his subjects with both dignity and authenticity. So the claim here that he captures diverse elements of Peruvian society with both dignity and authenticity, which finding if true would most directly support the student's claim. We've got option A. And let me actually scroll up so you can see the claim. There we go. 
Uh, Chambi took many commissioned portraits of wealthy Peruvians, but he also produced hundreds of images carefully documenting the people's sites and custom of indigenous communities of the Andes. So in this case, we are documenting sort of both sides of the wealthy Peruvian society as well as the indigenous communities. So that would support the fact that he's capturing the diverse elements of Peruvian society um, with dignity and authenticity. So that one looks good. Let's go and take a look at B. Uh, Chambi's photographs demonstrate a high level of technical skill as seen in strate strategic use of illumination to create dramatic light. A shadow contrast, we don't really care about sort of the technical details, so that wouldn't make sense. C. During his lifetime, he was known uh, and celebrated both within and outside his native place uh, as his work was published in places like Argentina, Spain, and Mexico. We don't care about where it's published. D, some of the people and places he photographed had long been popular subjects for photographers. That doesn't make sense either. Okay, so A's got to be our answer. That's the only one that supports our claim. Uh, so we've got some researchers studying indigenous actors and filmmakers in the United States have turned their attention to the early days of cinema, particularly the 1910s and 1920s when people like James Young Deer, Dark Cloud, Edwin Carraway, and Lillian St. Cyr, known professionally as Red Wing, were involved in one way or another with numerous films. In fact, so many films and associated records for this era have been lost that counts of those four figures output should be taken as bare minimums rather than totals. It's entirely possible, for example, that which choice effectively uses data from the table to complete the example. Well, since we're saying that these figures outputs are bare minimums rather than totals, we look for something showing that the totals could be higher than uh, what we have up here, which is number of films known and commonly credited, and then the individual on the left all right, so we've got which choice most effectively uses data from the table to complete the example. Dark Cloud acted in significantly fewer films than did someone else. That wouldn't support that claim because we're talking about uh, sort of comparing someone's output that is uh, recorded versus what the actual could have been. We're not comparing two to each other. B, uh, Edwin Series 47 credited acting roles include films, only films made after 19. That also wouldn't necessarily make sense. We're not really focused on sort of after 1934, especially not for this person, because we're only sort of discussing what's in the table. We don't want to go past that. Uh, if we go down to C, we've got Lillian St. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. Okay, there we go. Lillian St. Cyr acted in far more than 66 films and Edwin Suri directed more than 58. Let's take a look. Uh, Lillian St. Cyr, we got 66 as actor. Uh, we're saying that she did more than that, so that makes sense. Edwin uh, directed more than 58. We can find Edwin, director, he was 58. Okay, so he'd have to be more than that. So C would make sense there. If we look at D, James directed 33 films, acted in only 10. That's not going to be accurate to support our claim because our claim is that they did, did more than what was recorded. All right, question 15. Uh, Alicia Monta, Montesinos Navarro, Isabel Storer, and Rocio Perez Barrales recently examined several plots within a diverse plant community in Southeast Spain. The researchers calculated that if individual plants were randomly distributed on this particular landscape, only about 15% would be with other plants and patches of vegetation. They counted the number of juvenile plants of five species growing in patches of vegetation and the number growing alone on bare ground and compare those numbers to what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed. Based on these results, they claim the plants of these species that grow in close proximity to other plants gain an advantage at an early developmental stage. Which choice best which choice best describes data from the table that supports researchers' claim? All right, so ultimately, if we take a look at what their claim is, I, I think it would be right here. So they claim that plants of these species that grow in close proximity to other plants gain an advantage at an early developmental stage. If we look at our table, we have juvenile plants found growing on bare ground and in patches of vegetation for five species. So patches of vegetation would mean that they're growing in close proximity uh, to other plants. So they should have uh, a greater advantage. So we have percent found in patches of vegetation. We see it's going to be greater than 50%. Um, and we know that they were randomly distributed. So if it's greater than 50% of all of these are being found in patches of vegetation, that is good evidence that those that glow in close proximity to other plants gain an advantage at an early developmental stage. So we have option A for all five species, less than 75% of juvenile plants were growing in the patches of vegetation. Okay, that wouldn't make sense. We've got B. Species with the greatest number of juvenile plants growing in the patches of vegetation was uh, H. Stochus. That doesn't support the claim. If you look at C, uh, for these two, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was less than what would be expected if plants were randomly distributed. Uh, that's not true. It's actually there were more. Okay, there was more growing in patches of vegetation than what would be expected if it was randomly distributed. And then we have D, for each species, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in the patches of vegetation was substantially higher than what would be expected if plants were randomly distributed. Yes, that's perfect. In the mountains of Brazil, we've got these two species of plants in this family establish themselves on soilless, nutrient-poor patches of quartzite rock. In case they're nutrient-poor. Plant ecologists Ana Abreu and Patricio de Brito Costa used microscopic analysis to determine that the roots of these two, which grow directly into the quartzite, uh, have clusters of fine hairs near the root tip. Further analysis indicated that these hairs secrete both malic and citric acids. The researchers hypothesized that the plants depend on a dissolving underlying rock. Okay, hypothesize. So this is our hypothesis. Plants depend on dissolving underlying rock with these acids and 
or as the process not only creates channels for continued growth, but also releases phosphates that provide the vital nutrient phosphorus. Okay, so we have their hypothesis, which finding if true would most directly support the researcher's hypothesis. Well, their hypothesis is that the plants depend on dissolving this underlying rock in order to create, or not only to create channels for continued growth, but to gain phosphorus. Okay, so we've got option A, other species in the family are found in terrains with more soil, but have root structures similar to these two. That wouldn't provide any support to that. We've got B, though these two species both secrete citric and malic acids, each produces uh, different proportions. That wouldn't support it. We've got C, the roots of them both carve new entry points into rocks, even when cracks in the surface are readily available. This would make sense uh, because they're creating these new cracks in order to get the phosphorus, um, and they're not doing it just for um, creating channels of continued growth because there's already those channels available since there's already cracks in the surface available. So that would make sense. We have D, these two thrive even when transferred to surfaces of rocks that do not contain uh, phosphates. That would actually not support it. That'd go against it. So C would make the most sense there. Herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs could grow more than 100 feet long and weigh up to 80 tons. And some researchers have attributed the evolution of sauropods to such massive sizes, to such massive sizes, increased plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide during the Mesozoic era. Okay, so we've got a guess or sort of a hypothesis attributing the evolution of seropods to such massive sizes to increase plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide during the Mesozoic era. Okay, so we kind of have their hypothesis. However, there is no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in the seropod evolution, such as when the first large seropods appeared, or when several seropod lineages underwent further evolution toward gigantism, or when seropods reached their maximum known sizes, suggesting that uh, we've got option A, fluctuations in atmospheric carbon dioxide affected different seropod lineages differently. That doesn't really seem to make sense here. We've got B, evolution of larger body sizes in seropods did not, dispend, did not depend on increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. That would make the most sense because we see that what comes after this sort of um, guess of the attribution is actually not supportive of this attribution. Okay, We have, however, indicating a contrast Then we talk about how there's no evidence of significant spikes in the carbon dioxide levels. Uh, if we take a look at answer choice C, we have atmospheric carbon dioxide was higher when the largest known seropods lived than it was when the first seropods lived. Uh, that doesn't really go along with what we see in here where it says there's no evidence of significant spikes in the dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in their evolution. Um, so that wouldn't really make sense. Then we have D, seropods probably would not have evolved to such immense size if atmospheric carbon dioxide had been even slightly higher. Okay, once again, that doesn't really, it's not really supported anywhere in the text. So the only answer that's supported in the text would be B. In documents called judicial opinions, judges explain the reasoning behind their legal rulings. And in those explanations, they sometimes cite and discuss historical and contemporary philosophers. Legal scholar and philosopher Anita L. Allen argues that while judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. Discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views could therefore... I've got option A, allow judges to craft judicial opinions without needing to consult philosophical works. That doesn't really make sense. And keep in mind, we're just looking to logically complete the text. We've got B, help judges improve the arguments uh, they put forward in their judicial opinions. That could make sense here um, because we're ultimately talking about a way to which is say discussing the views that conflict with their judges could therefore help them improve their arguments they put forward. That makes sense because previously we said that the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections, right? So ultimately, if we want to create um, stronger judicial opinions or improve the arguments in the ju judicial opinions, we would need to make them stronger. Therefore, we need to rebut poten potential objections. Um, and therefore, we would need to discuss philosophers whose views conflict with the judges' views. So that makes the most sense. We have C, make judicial opinions more comprehensible to readers without legal or philosophical training. No. And then D, bring judicial opinions in line with views that are broadly held among philosophers. No, that's not the point of the text. So hence, there would have to be B. Public awareness campaigns about the need to reduce single-use plastics can be successful, says researcher Kim Borg of Monash University in Australia. When these campaigns give consumers a choice, for example, Japan achieved a 40% reduction in plastic bag use after cashiers instructed we're instructed to ask customers whether they wanted a bag. They is going to refer back to uh, the customers, whether they want a bag, uh, which choice completes a text so it conforms to the conventions of standard English. This will be a very, very common question type on English and writing, our reading and writing on the SAT. Okay, so our answer has got to be they. We need to match our uh, number of our noun back to the customers. In ancient Greece, an Epicurean was a flower of Epicurus, a philosopher whose beliefs revolved around the pursuit of pleasure. Epicurus defined pleasure as the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the, it looks like we're going to have soul, that all of life's virtues derive from this absence. So we're going to close out this quote. So we have pleasure as the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul. Okay, this is an independent clause up to the end of this quotation. 
Uh, after that, we have positing that all of life's virtue is derived from this absence. That's a participle phrase. Keep in mind, it is not an independent clause from what I'm going to underline here. Okay, this is not an independent clause even with positing. So therefore, we can't have a semicolon there because ultimately, like I said, it's not an independent clause. Uh, same thing with period and uh, or I guess this is a colon, sorry. This is colon, this is semicolon, okay, and a period. We wouldn't use all of those because it's a participle phrase, so we would connect it with a comma. Okay, so we connect a participle phrase with a comma. Um, so not an independent clause, can't be B, C, or D. We can go and move on to question number 21. British scientists James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize in part for their 1953 paper announcing the double helix structure of DNA, but it is misleading to say that Watson and Crick discovered the double helix um, we have blanks were based on a famous x-ray image of DNA fibers, fibers, photo 51. Okay. So in this case, we're talking about their findings, Watson and Crick. Okay. So their T H E I R. Okay. A would be they are, which wouldn't make sense. We know that there are obviously plural since there are two of them, Watson and Crick. So it's gotta be C their T H E I R. 1957 Chinese American screen actor, Anna Mae Wong, who had portrayed numerous villains and secondary characters, but never a heroine finally got a starring role in Paramount Pictures, Daughter of Shanghai a film that blank and then quote expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. Okay. So a film that critic Steina Chain claims, uh, well, we couldn't remove Steina Chine because then we'd have a film that critic claims. Um, if we're going to say a film that critic claims, you'd have to say a film that a critic claims. We can't just say a film that critic claims. So it's essential. So it can't be removed. Therefore we can get rid of a and we can get rid of B. Then between uh, D and C, we can take a look at if we need a comma uh, here. So we've got a film that Stina Chin claims expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. As you can see, that is an integrated quotation. It is integrated within the sentence, and therefore we don't need a comma actually before this quotation mark. So therefore we can get rid of D and our answer there would be C. In 1637, the price of tulips skyrocketed in Amsterdam with single bulbs of rare varieties selling for up to the equivalent of 200000 in today's US dollars. Some historians blank that this tulip mania uh, we've got which choice completes a text so it conforms to conventions. Okay, so some historians blank that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble, so probably something along the lines of claim, uh, which occurs when investors drive prices too high is not supported by actual demand. So in this case, it looks like we are using the word claim. We just got to kind of figure out the tense here. So we've got some historians. Well, let's go back and figure out what our tense is. I think it's going to be claim, but let's just make sure we've got in 1637 price of tulips skyrocketed in Amsterdam, case of past tense, with single bulbs of rare varieties selling for up to the equivalent of $200,000 in today's US dollars. So now we're talking about modern times. Some historians, okay, so people in modern times, claim that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble, which occurs when investors drive prices too high is not supported by actual demand. Okay, some historians claim not claimed. It wouldn't be too claim. Having claimed wouldn't make sense. Claiming, it would just be claimed. Some historians claim that this happened. Researchers studying magnetism have determined why some soil dwelling roundworms in the southern hemisphere move in the opposite direction of Earth's magnetic field when searching for, and then we have food um, or food well. All right, so we've got, let me go ahead and start from the beginning the sentence. Researchers studying magnetism have determined why some soil dwelling roundworms in the southern hemisphere move in the opposite direction of Earth's magnetic fields when searching for food. In the northern hemisphere, the magnetic field points down into the ground, but in the southern hemisphere, it points up toward the surface and away from womb, from worms' food sources. All right, well, we've got heat right here in the southern hemisphere. They move in the opposite direction of Earth's magnetic field when searching for food. And now we are then talking about, uh, after that, in the northern hemisphere. So a little bit of a contrast, but at the same time, we have in the northern hemisphere, the magnetic field points down into the ground, but in the southern hemisphere, it points up toward the surface and away from worms' food surface. That's an independent clause. Now prior, um, so looking from over here, we also have an independent clause, which is studying magnetism, had determined why some of these move in the opposite direction of Earth's magnetic field when searching for food. So we have two independent clauses, okay? So we can't connect them with only a comma unless we have one of the fanboys, which we don't. We can't connect them with just well. We have to connect them with something. Um, we can connect them with a colon, okay? So our answer there would be A. We've got scientists believe that unlike most other species of barnacle, turtle barnacles can dissolve the cement-like secretions they use to attach to uh, they use to attach blank, um, so it themselves, them, itself. Well, in this case, we're talking about turtle barnacles. So turtle barnacles can dissolve the cement-like secretions they use to attach themselves to a sea turtle shell. Okay, so we have to use themselves, not it, not them, not itself, themselves referring to the turtle barnacles. The classic children's board game, Shoots and Ladders, is a version of ancient Napoli's game, Paramipeta Sopanapata. In both games, players encounter good or bad spaces while traveling along a path, landing on one of the good spaces. Blank, a player to skip ahead. We've got allows, are allowing, have allowed, allow. Okay, we've got a player, which is singular. So landing on one of the good spaces allows a player to skip ahead and arrive closer to the end goal. 
Okay, keep in mind, this is pretty much a tense and matching the number of your subject to number of your verb question. Okay, we're dealing in the present tense. Okay, we would say he, or example, a player, right? Since that's our subject, we'll use that. We'd say a player allows something, right? We're just matching a player to allows. Um, if we had players allow, okay? So if you wanna figure out whether or not um, one of your verbs is supposed to be singular or plural, you could do something like that. You could also use he and they. Um, so for example, since player is singular, could you do he or she um, allows, and then it would be they allow. So that's kind of a trick you can use there. But with that being said, let's go ahead and circle our answer and move on. Question 27, in 1943, in the midst of World War II, the mathematics professor Grace Hopper was recruited by the U.S. military to help the war effort by solving complex equations. Hopper's subsequent career would involve more than just equations, though. And then we have, as a pioneering computer programmer, Hopper would help usher in the digital age as an independent clause. Also, what came before is an independent clause, and Hopper's subsequent career would involve more than just equations. We have two independent clauses we have to connect. Uh, so we can't use B, because if we're going to use just a comma, we would have to also have a fanboy. Uh, though needs to go before or right after equations, okay? Equations and though need to be in the same um, sort of independent clause. Uh, they can't be, we need whatever we're gonna use to split, whether that's a, a colon or a period, whatever, would have to ha come after though, so we can get rid of C as well. We do need to have some sort of punctuation there, so our answer would have to be A. We're using a colon in order to connect two independent clauses where the second one is illustrating the first, and though does need to come within that first uh, section before that colon. 1453, English King Henry became unfit to rule after falling gravely ill. As a result, Parliament appointed Richard, third Duke of York, who had a strong claim to the English throne to rule as Lord Protector upon receiving, or upon recovering two years later, blank, okay, this is gonna have to be whoever recovered two years later, uh, which is the person who became unfit to rule after falling ill, so it'd have to be King Henry. Uh, so if we look at our options, which choice completes the text that it conforms to the Convention of Standard English? Okay, a quick explanation on this that you need to know for the writing section is upon recovering two years later, okay, that's an introductory modifier. Okay, it's modifying whatever comes after it. So it has to be who recovered two years later. Well, that would be Henry. It's not the reign of Henry. It's not Henry's reign. And it's not it was Henry. It has to be the exact subject it's modifying, which is King Henry. So it has to be A. Although novels and poems are considered distinct literary forms, many authors have created hybrid works that incorporate elements of both. Bernard... Bernardine Avaristo is the Emperor Babe. Blank is a verse novel, a book-length narrative complete with characters and a plot, but conveyed in short, crisp lines of poetry rather than prose. Well, that's sort of an example. That is an example of a hybrid work that incorporates elements of both novels and poems. So we need to have something that's saying it's an example. Uh, so our answer would have to be D. Question 30. At two weeks old, the time the critical socialization period begins, wolves can smell but cannot see or hear yet, domesticated dogs can see, hear, and smell by the end of two weeks. This relative lack of sensory input may help explain why wolves behave so differently around humans than dogs do. For a very young age, wolves are more wary and less exploratory, which choice completes the text with the most logical transition. Well, obviously we have a contrast here because the wolves can't, the dogs can. So contrast by contrast, it makes sense accordingly wouldn't, for instance, wouldn't, and in other words wouldn't. So our answer there would have to be C. Question 31, researchers Helena, Mihal, Javik, Brandt, Lucia, Santa Maria, and Marco Tolney report that while mathematicians may have traditionally worked alone, evidence points to a shift in the opposite direction. Okay, so we're looking for a contrast here. Uh, mathematicians are choosing to collaborate with their peers, a trend illustrated by the rise in number of mathematics, publications credited to multiple authors. We wouldn't use similarly uh, for this reason. We're not describing any sort of reason. Furthermore, wouldn't really make sense there either. We're not adding on to something. Okay, we state that before they worked alone, evidence points to a shift. Increasingly, they are choosing to collaborate with their peers, a uh, trend illustrated by the rise in number of mathematics. Mathematician publications credited to multiple authors, so that would make the most sense there, D, increasingly. Question 32, while researching a topic, a student has taken the following notes. Pteosaurs were flying reptiles that existed millions of years ago in 2021 study, and Nusia analyzed fragments of Pterosaur jar bones located in the Sahara Desert. She was initially unsure if the bones belonged to juvenile or adult predators. Uh, she uses ad she used advanced microscopic microscope techniques to determine that the bones had few line growths relative to the bones of fully grown pterosaurs. She concluded that the bones belonged to juveniles. The student wants to present the study and its findings. Which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal? All right, well, presenting the study and its finding, if we go and take a look at what our study is, it's ultimately about finding these dinosaur bones and determining if they are juvenile or adult, uh, using uh, growth lines, and concluding that they belong to juveniles. So if you look down, we've got option A. In 2021, uh, she studied uh, these bones and was initially unsure if they belong to juveniles or adults. Keep in mind, we want to show the findings as well. So study and the findings, that just talks about the study. B is very short, just stating that they were located in the desert and it was the focus of a study. C 
And a study uh, uses advanced microscope techniques to analyze jawbones, flying reptiles that existed millions of years ago. It also does not discuss findings. We've got D. Uh, in a 2021 study determined that the jaw bones located in the Sahara Desert had few growth lines relative to the bones of fully grown uh, patiosaurs and thus belong to juveniles. That also includes the findings and talks about the study. So D makes the most sense there. We can go and move on to our next question. While researching a topic, students taking the following notes, African-American women played prominent roles in the civil rights movement, including at the famous 1963 March on Washington, civil rights activist Anna Hedgeman, one of the march's organizers, was a political advisor who had worked for President Truman. Civil rights activist Daisy Bates was a well-known journalist and advocated for school desegregation. Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman was included in the lineup of speakers at the march. Bates was the sole woman to speak, delivering a brief but memorable address to the cheering crowd. The student wants to compare the two women's contributions to the march on Washington, which shows most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal. Well, we know that Bates is the woman who spoke and Hedgeman was the one who kind of organized things behind the scenes. We have option A, Hedgeman and Bates contributed to the march in different ways. Bates, for example, delivered a brief but memorable address address, see what exactly our goal is. Student wants to compare the contributions. This one doesn't necessarily compare them. It sort of states that they contribute in different ways, but then only discusses the way that Bates contributed. So I'll leave that kind of as a maybe for now. If we look at B, Hedgeman worked in politics and helped organize the march. Well, Bates, Bates was a journalist and school de desegregation advocate that doesn't talk specifically about the march on Washington. Um, and then we've got C, although Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman speaker was included. So that's talking about specifically what Hedgeman did. Bates was the sole woman to speak at the march. So talking about specifically what each person did at the march, that makes way more sense than A, um, which is just saying that they contributed in different ways, but doesn't mention how Hedgeman contributed. And then we have D, many African-American women, including Bates and Hedgeman, fought for civil rights, but only one spoke at the march. Okay, once again, that doesn't even state who spoke at the march. Okay, it doesn't talk about specifically what they did. C would make the most sense there to compare their contributions to the march on Washington specific. Question one, for Jacob Lawrence being blank was an important part of the artistic process because he paid close attention to all the details of his Harlem neighborhood. So he's paying attention to details. Lawrence's artwork captured nuances in the beauty and vitality of the black experience during the Harlem Renaissance and the Great Migration. Uh, we've got the option of being skeptical was an important part. Uh, being observant would make more sense because they were talking about artistic detail. Being critical wouldn't really make sense there. Uh, he's not critiquing anything. He's capturing nuances and beauty. Uh, that would be being observant. So our answer there would be B. Monica Lopez Fiera and others at Brazil's Butantan Institute are studying the freshwater stingray species Patagomorum rex to determine whether biological characteristics such as the rays, age, and sex have blank effect on the toxicity of their venom. That is to see if the different to see if differences in these traits are common are associated with considerable variations in venom potency, which choice completes the text of the most logical and precise word or phrase. Okay, so have some effect. We've got a disconcerting, an acceptable, an imperceptible, or a substantial. Most likely be looking for a substantial effect. That is to see if differences in these traits are associated with considerable variations. So substantial effect would be what we'd be looking for there. So our answer would be D. Researchers have struggled to pinpoint specific causes for hiccups, which happen when a person's diaphragm contracts blank. However, neuroscientists uh, found the uncontrollable contractions may play an important role in helping infants regulate their breathing, which choice completes, okay, uh, in which, which happen when a person's diaphragm contracts involuntarily would make the most sense, not beneficially, uh, strenuously, no, smoothly, involuntarily. We all know that from hiccups. We can go ahead and move on. Critics have asserted that fine art and fashion rarely blank in a world where artists create timeless works for exhibition and designers periodically produce new styles for the public to buy. Luisina... Uh, this person, bedwork artist and designer, challenges this view. Her work can be seen in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and purchased through her online uh, boutique. So in this case, she's challenging a view. So if we go up here, uh, they assert that they rarely do what? Well, in this case, we see that they come together because they're in both the museum and the online boutique. Uh, so we have rarely prevail. That wouldn't make sense. We're talking about them coming together, um, not diverge because we need them to come together. Intersect would make the most sense there. Um, succumb wouldn't make sense. So intersect would be our answer there. Scholarly discussions of gender in Shakespeare's comedies often celebrate the rebellion of the playwright's characters against the rigid expectations blank by Elizabeth Elizabethan society. I would imagine that's set by uh, most of the comedies and in marriage with characters returning to their socially dictated gender roles after previously defying them. But there are some notable exceptions. We have uh, interjected, committed wouldn't really make sense there. Uh, illustrated wouldn't really make sense. Prescribed would make the most sense. Okay. These are expectations that are prescribed by Elizabethan society. In studying the use of external stimuli to reduce the itching sensation caused by an allergic histamine response, Louise Ward and colleagues found that while harmless applications of vibration or warming can provide 
provide a temporary distraction. Such blank stimuli actually offer less relief than a stimulus that seems less benign, like a mild electric shock. Okay, so we're looking for something that uh, is more benign than a mild electric shock. So we're talking about this up here, which is harmless application. So we're looking for a word basically that means um, such like well-meaning stimuli or something along those lines, uh, not deceptive. Um, innocuous would probably be the best fit, or at least so far. Novel wouldn't make any sense. Impractical, uh, we're not talking about impractical stuff. We're not talking about novel stuff. Innocuous would essentially mean pretty close to harmless, which is what we're talking about up here. Um, harmless applications, right? Applications that are benign, um, that aren't going to have any sort of drastic or significant you know, negative effect. So innocuous would be the best answer there. The province of Okso Kanoko was situated on the Pacific coast, hundreds of kilometers southeast of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, because Tenochtitlan's location within the empire was so blank. Cocoa and other trade goods produced there could reach the capital only after a long overland journey. I would guess it's something like it was so remote if it takes um, a long overland journey, um, something along those lines. Uh, so we've got which choice best completes, um, unobtrusive. That wouldn't make sense. It would have to be obtrusive, right, for it to be hard to get to. Uh, concealed, because it was so concealed, um, it could only be reached after a long overland journey, possibly. Um, approximate wouldn't make sense. Uh, peripheral would make the most sense here, okay? Because if it's on the peripheral, it's going to take a long time to travel to get there. So D would be our answer there. The following text is from Charlotte Bronx. 1847 novel Jane Eyre. Jane it works as a governess, Thornfield Hall. I went on with my day's tr business tranquilly, but ever and anon vague suggestions kept wandering across my brain of reasons why I should quit Thornfield, and I kept involuntarily framing advertisements and pondering conjectures about new situations. These thoughts I did not think to check. They might germinate and bear fruit if they could. Which choice best states the main purpose of the text? A, to convey a contrast between Jane's outward calmness and internal restlessness. That seems like it could be an answer, so I'll just mark that with a check for now. We've got B, to emphasize Jane's loyalty to the people she works for at Thornfield Hall. No. We got C, to demonstrate that Jane finds her situation both challenging and deeply fulfilling. No. And then we've got D, to describe Jane's determination to secure employment outside. She is considering it um, and sort of has this internal restlessness over whether she should, but she doesn't have a determination to do it. Okay, so A would be our answer there. Most animals can regenerate some parts of their body, such as skin, but when a three-branded panther worm is cut into three pieces, each piece grows into a new worm. Researchers are investigating this feat partly to learn more about humans' comparative, compa comparatively limited abilities to regenerate, and they're making exciting progress, and especially promising discoveries that both humans and panther worms have a gene for early growth response, EGR, linked to regeneration. Then we have text number two. When Mansi S and her team reported that panther worms like humans possess a gene for EGR, it causes excitement. However, as the team pointed out, the gene likely functions very differently in humans than it does in panther worms. S has likened EGR to a switch that activates other genes involved in regeneration in panther worms, but how the switch operates in humans remains unclear. Okay, so basically what I got from that is text one is optimistic, text two is refuting that optimism with what reality of the situation is. We've got based on the text, what would the author of text two most likely say about text one? Characterization about the discovery involving EGR, that's overly optimistic is my guess. Option A, it's reasonable given that S and her team have identified how EGR works in both humans and panther worms. We know that's not accurate to the text. We have B, it's overly optimistic. Yes, that would make the most sense there given additional observations from S and her team. We can go ahead and get answer with B. If we take a quick look at C and D, uh, it's unexpected given that S and her team's findings were generally met with enthusiasm. No. And then D, it's unfairly dismissive. Uh, no. So we know that it's overly optimistic. The following text is adapted from William Shakespeare's 1609 poem, Sonnet 27. The poem is addressed to a close friend as if he were physically present. Weary with toil, I hurry to my bed. The deer repose for limbs with travel tired, but then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's work expired. For then my thoughts from far where I abide begin a zealous pilgrimage to thee and keep my drooping eyelids open wide. What is the main idea of the text? We have option A, speaker is asleep and dreaming about traveling uh, to a friend. Well, we know he's not asleep. He's being kept awake by this. Uh, we've got B, the speaker is planning an upcoming trip to his friend's house. No, we have to touch on the fact that it's sort of keeping him awake. We've got C, speaker's too fatigued to continue a discussion with a friend. No. And then D, the speaker is thinking about the friend instead of immediately falling asleep. Yes, that's what's accurate to the text. The following text is adapted from Lewis Carroll's 1889 satirical novel, Sylvia and Bruno. A crowd is gathered outside a room belonging to the warden, an official who reports to the Lord Chancellor. One man who is more excited than the rest flung his high hat into the air, his hat high into the air, and shouted, as well as I can make out, who roar for the sub warden ever Everybody roared, but whether it was for the sub warden or not, I did not did not clearly appear. Some were shouting bread and some taxes, but no one seemed to know what it was they really wanted. 
All this I saw from the open window of the warden's uh, breakfast saloon, looking across the shoulder of Lord Chancellor. What can it all mean? He kept repeating to himself. I never heard such shouting before and at this time of the morning too, and with such unanimity. Based on the text, how does Lord Chancellor respond to the crowd? Okay, well, he obviously isn't really sure what they want, but he knows that they are gathered together sort of in unison, um, sort of with some sort of commonality. So we have option A, he asks about the meaning of the crowd's shouting, uh, even though he claims to know what the crowd wants, no. B, he indicates a desire to speak to the crowd, even though the crowd was, has asked to speak to the subwarden, no. C, he expresses sympathy for the crowd's demands, no. Uh, D, he describes the crowd as being united, even though the crowd clearly appears otherwise, yes. O Pioneers is a 1913 novel by Willa Cather. In the novel, Cather portrays Alexandra Bergson as having a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. Which quotation from O Pioneers most effectively illustrates the claim? Keep in mind the claim is that she has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. I've got option A, she had never known before how much the country meant to her. The chirping of the insects down in the long grass had been like the sweetest music. She had felt as if her heart were hiding down there, somewhere with the quail and the plover and all the little wild things that crooned or buzzed in the sun under the long shaggy ridges she felt the future stirring okay that really does support the fact that she's got a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings let's quickly read through the rest it looks like our answer will be a though we got alexander talks to the men about their crops and to the women about their poultry she spent a whole day with one young farmer who had been away at school that one's not going to be it if you look at c she drove off alone rattle of her wagon was lost in the wind but her lantern held firmly to her feet. Once again, not talking enough about nature there. And then D, talking about papers, markets, learning the mistakes of their neighbors, talking about the cost of steers. Okay, so the answer there's got to be A. That's the only one that supports that claim. A group of researchers working in Europe, Asia, and Oceania conducted a study to determine how quickly different Eurasian languages are typically spoken in syllables per second and how much information they can effectively convey in bits per second. They found that although the languages vary widely in the speed at which they are spoken, the amount of information languages can effectively convey tends to vary much less. Thus, they claim that two languages with very different spoken rates can nonetheless convey the same amount of information in a given amount of time. Which choice best describes data from the table that supports the researcher's claim? All right, let's take a quick look at the claim. So we've got rate of information conveyed in bits per second. We see all of these are pretty close, even though if we look at the rate of speech, um, it looks like the rate of speech probably differs um, much more sort of from the, the average or the median than does the, the rates of information conveyed. Uh, so let's go ahead and go down and see if we have something that is sort of using um, a couple of those rows to illustrate this or maybe the data as a whole. So we have option A, among the five languages in the table, Thai and Hungarian have the lowest rates of speech and the lowest rates of information conveyed. Uh, we can get rid of that. That doesn't support the claim. B, Vietnamese conveys information at approximately the same rate as Spanish, despite being speak, spoken at a slower rate. That looks like it could be good. If we look at C, among the five languages in the table, the language that is spoken the fastest is also that the language that conveys information the fastest. That doesn't support the claim. And then D, Serbian and Spanish are spoken at approximately the same rate, but Serbian conveys information faster than Spanish does. That wouldn't support it, so our answer has got to be B. Psychologists Dasher, Keltner, and Jonathan Hyde have argued that experiencing awe, sensation of reverence and wonder typically brought on by perceiving something grand or powerful can enable us to feel more connected to others and thereby aspire, inspire us to act more altruistically. Keltner, along with Paul and all these people, claim to have found evidence for this effect in a recent study where participants were asked to either gaze up at exceptionally tall trees in a nearby grove reported to be a universally awe-inspiring experience or stare at the exterior of a nearby nondescript building. After one minute, an experimenter deliberately spilled a box of pens nearby, uh, which finding from the researcher's study, if true, would most strongly support the claim. Let's go back and quickly underline the claim, so they argue that experiencing awe can enable us to feel more connected to others and thereby inspire us to act more altruistically. So if we go down, we've got option A, participants who had been looking at the trees helped the experimenter pick up significantly more pens than did participants who had been looking at the building. That would make sense because they're acting in a manner that helps others. We got B, participants who helped the experiment pick up pens used a greater number of positive words to describe the trees. No. Uh, C, participants who did not help the experiment pick up the pens were significantly more likely to report having experienced a feeling of awe. No, that would be contrasting. And then we've got D, uh, participants who had been looking at the building were significantly more likely to notice the experiment or drop the pens. That would not support it. So the only one here that would support that claim would be answer choice A. Over the past 200 years, the percentage of the population employed in the agricultural sector has declined in both France and the United States. While employment in the service sector, which includes jobs in retail, consulting, real estate, etc., has ri risen. However, this transition happened at very different rates in two countries. Uh, this can be seen most clearly by comparing the employment by sector in both countries in blank, which state, which choice most effectively uses data from the table to complete the statement. All right, so we got to show that this happened at different rates. We got option A in 1900, the employment sector in 1950. Well, if we go up here, we are looking at the menu or the agriculture versus the services. Okay, so if we take a look at agriculture in 1900, 1950, 2012, we see that we get 
um, a big drop here from 1950 to 1912. However, in the U.S., in terms of agricultural, we get that big drop about 50 years earlier from 41 to 14. Um, so we've got option A, 1900 with 1950. Well, that would show us that we get a big jump in the U.S., but uh, that wouldn't really show us that we end up getting sort of the, the big jump in France, which is what we are looking for there. So that looks good. If we take a look at B, 1800 and 2012, that wouldn't help because it doesn't show that there's really different rates, right? Because you end up with 64 and 3 and then you end up 62. So that's not helpful. Uh, C, 1900 with the employment by 2012. Once again, that's not really going to help because in 2012, they're both at two. So we need to show that they're at different rates, 1800, 1900. Uh, they're both roughly the same. So that wouldn't make sense either. Okay. A is our best answer because if we compare 1900 to 1950, we get only a small, we go from 43 to 32, right? In France, but we go from 41 to 14, which is a much steeper drop um, in the U S. So A would be the best support there. Many archeologists will tell you that categorizing excavated fragments of pottery by style period and what objects they belong to relies not only on standard criteria, but also on indis on in instinct developed over years of practice. In a recent study, however, researchers trained a deep learning mo computer model on thousands of images of pottery fragments and found that it could categorize them as accurately as a team of expert archaeologists. Some archaeologists have expressed concern that they might be replaced by computer models, but the researchers claim that outcome is highly unlikely, which finding, if true, would most directly support the researcher's claim. Okay, keep in mind that the researcher's claim is that it's highly unlikely. Okay, so highly unlikely they get replaced by computer models. Always make sure you know what claim you're trying to support. So you have option A, in the researcher's study, the model was able to categorize the pottery fragments much more quickly than the archaeologists could. That'd be the opposite of our support. That'd be support against. We got B, in the researcher's study, neither the model nor the archaeologists were able to accurately categorize all of them. No. C, a survey of archaeologists showed that categorizing pottery fragments limits the amount of time they can dedicate uh, to other important tasks that only human experts could do. Uh, let's take a look at D. We have a survey of archaeologists showed that few of them received dedicated training in how to properly categorize pottery fragments. That wouldn't make sense. Okay, our best support there would be C. A survey of archaeologists showed that categorizing pottery fragments limits the amount of time they dedicate to other important tasks that only human experts can do. Okay, it's showing that really the computer models would be a tool to them, not replace them. Although military veterans make up a small proportion of the total population in the United States, they occupy a significantly higher proportion of the jobs in the civilian government. One possible explanation for this disproportionate representation is that military service familiarizes people with certain organizational structures that are also reflected in civilian government bureaucracy. And this familiarity thus, okay, well, the most logical thing here would be that, you know, they're already familiar with something, so they would want to do it, them being the military. So we have option A, make civilian government jobs especially appealing to military veterans. That would make the most sense if we take a quick look at B, alters typical relationship between military service and subsequent career paths. We're not altering anything, right? It's just that they're more familiar with um, sort of this organizational structure, thus they'd be attracted to that organizational structure. If you look at C, encourages non-veterans applying for civilian government jobs, consider military service. Instead, that's pretty much completely out of left field and pretty random. We have D, increased the number of civilian government jobs that require some amount of military experience to perform. Once again, that's out of left field. Okay, The only answer there that makes sense is A. Birds of many species ingest foods containing carotenoids, pigmented molecules that are converted into feather coloration. Coloration tends to especially saturated in male birds' feathers, and because carotenoids also confer health benefits, the deeply saturated colors generally serve to communicate what is known as an honest signal of a bird's overall fitness potential mates. However, a bird doctor or bird scientist is basically what an orthonologist is. It's a, a bird scientist. Allison J. Schultz and others have found that males in several species of the tanager uh, genus R use microstructures in their feathers to manipulate light, creating the appearance of deeper saturation without the birds necessarily having to maintain a carotenoid-rich diet. These findings suggest that it would pretty much be that they don't actually have an honest representation, as was claimed earlier in the text. We have option A, individual male uh, tanagers can engage in honest signaling without relying on carotenoid consumption. No, B, feather microstructures may be less affected than deeply saturated. Others for signaling overall fitness, no. C, Scientists have yet to determine why tanagers have a preference for mates with colorful appearances. No, D, a male tanager's appearance may function as a dishonest signal of the individual's overall fitness. Yes, because they're ultimately uh, using their microstructures in order to manipulate the color of light. All right, question 19, and one thing I want to make note of now is as you start getting a little bit deeper into the reading section is where you start to get to the, the writing questions. So if you do start to get to the writing questions, you can kind of notice by if you glance at your answer choices, you'll notice that it's obviously much shorter. Um, so that's just something you want to be aware of. And then if you glance at your answer choices, in this case, we have were, have been, has been, are. So we're looking for basically a tense and um, matching number of our verb to the number of our subjects. We have one writing, the other black girl, 2021 novelist, uh, ZDH, drew on her experiences working at a publishing office, award-winning book is Harris's first novel, but her writing blank honored before. Uh, so we've got were, that wouldn't match the number. Okay, because it's singular, her writing is singular. Same with have been, doesn't match. Uh, same with are as well. Okay, it has to be 
has been. Her writing has been honored before. Uh, at the age of 12, she entered a contest uh, in one case that would make sense, has been. So her answer there would be C. The Alvarez theory developed in 1980 by physicist Luis Walter Alvarez and his geologist son, Walter Alvarez, maintained that the secondary effects of an asteroid impact caused, by, caused many dinosaurs and other animals to die blank. It left unexplored. Okay, we've got uh, to die out. All right, so that's an independent clause. And then we have it left unexplored, the question of whether unrelated volcanic activity might have also contributed to mass extinctions. Uh, so that's also an independent clause. We have two independent clauses we need to connect, which means that we can't have no comma unless we had a semicolon um, or a period or a colon. Um, if we look at other options, we got to get rid of this. Uh, we can't just do comma. Okay, we have to have a comma in one of the fanboys. So our answer has got to be B. In winter, the diets of Japanese, also known as snow monkeys, are influenced more by food availability than by food preference. Although the monkeys prefer to eat vegetation and land-dwelling invertebrates, uh, these food sources might may become unavailable because of extensive snow and ice cover, uh, forcing uh, forcing the monkeys to hunt for marine animals in any streams that may have not frozen over. And so there's got to be forcing. Okay, how do we know that? Well, ultimately, we are using what's underlined right here, okay, to describe what is forcing them to do it, right? Which is uh, the extensive snow and ice cover. Okay, so whenever you have that, you should look for the ending in I and G. So our answer there's gotta be C. Lucia Michelle of the University of Chile observed that alkaline soils contain an insoluble form of iron that blueberry plants cannot absorb, thus inhibiting blueberry growth. If these plants were grown in alkaline soils alongside grasses that aid in iron solubilization, could the blueberries thrive? The blueberries could thrive. Okay, well, we can't say that uh, and then we have Michelle was determined to find out. Okay, so we can't say that blueberries could thrive because we don't know if they can or not. That's the whole point of her trying to find out. So we can get rid of B and C. Uh, and then we have a period versus a question mark. This is a question. So our answer there would have to be D. In his 1963 exhibition, Exposition of Music, Electronic Television, Korean American artist uh, NJP showed his television images could be manipulated to express an artist's per perspective. Uh, today, P blank considered the first video artist. Uh, since it's today, it would be, and it's singular because it's one person. So today uh, we could say he is considered the first uh, video artist. So in other words, singular. So Pike is uh, considered the uh, first video artist. Okay. It wouldn't be will be, had, been, or was. This is a question matching with uh, your tense and then also matching the number of your subject to the number of your verb. So answer's got to be D. The first computerized spreadsheet, uh, DB's VisiCalc, Improved financial record keeping not only by providing users with an easy means of adjusting data in spreadsheets, but also by automatically updating all calculations that were dependent on these adjustments. Okay, so on these adjustments, uh, and then blank to VisiCalc's release. Okay, prior to VisiCalc's release, changing a paper spreadsheet often required redoing the entire sheet by hand. Okay, so this is going to be another independent clause for connecting two independent clauses. So in order to do that, uh, we can't just have a comma like this. Uh, we can't have no punctuation. We can't just say and. We'd have to have a period. So our answer would have to be C. In order to prevent non-native fish species from freely moving or from moving freely between the Mediterranean and the Red Seas, marine biologist Bella Galil has proposed a saline lock system be installed along the Suez Canal and Egypt's Great Bitter Lakes. The lock would increase the salinity of the lakes and create Okay, and the way that we get create is because we look down here, we know we're using the word create, and then I see the word increase over here. It would increase the salinity of the lakes and create a natural barrier. Okay, we need to match with increase right there. So we have to have create. So our answer's got to be B. Despite being cheap, versatile, and easy to produce, blank, they are made from non-renewable petroleum and most do not biograde in landfills. Okay, so we need to have um, whatever is cheap, versatile, and easy to produce right here. So we've got, uh, there are two problems. Uh, commercial plastics, two associated problems are that Okay, so we need to have the subjects we can get rid of. There are two. In this case, we would have commercial plastics, two associated problems. So the two associated problems are actually what would be being modified there, but we need the commercial plastics itself to be modified, not the two associated problems. Okay, because this right here is an introductory modifying phrase or clause, right? So it's being applied to whatever comes immediately after the comma right here. And we need that to be commercial plastics, which is answer choice D. Stomata, tiny pore structures in a leaf that absorb gases needed for plant growth open when guard cells surrounding each pore swell with water. In a pivotal 2007 article, plant cell biologist Yuri Lee showed that lipid molecules called blank and then whatever. Okay, so we've got in a pivotal 2007 article, plant cell biologist uh, Yuri Lee Okay, keep in mind that Yuri Lee in this case is non-essential, okay, because it's describing the article's author, right? It's in a pivotal 2007 article. That's an introductory modifier that modifies the entire plant cell biologist Yuri Lee. So it's not non-essential, okay? So we can't have a comma there, can't have a comma afterwards either. Uh, there's just no reason to have it. Um, if we take a look at other options, that would indicate it's non-essential. Okay, so our answer's gotta be C. So no need for commas here, here. It's also going to be essential. So D would be wrong, our answer's gotta be C. Small flat structures called spatulae are found in the tips of the hairs of a, on a spider's leg. These spatulae temporarily bond with the atoms of whatever they touch. And then we have blank. Spiders are able to cling to and climb almost any 
surface, well, since they temporarily bond to the atoms, whatever they touch, um, this is what would allow them to cling and climb almost on almost any surface. Uh, so we've got, however, it's not a contrast. Um, it's not any sort of similarity. As a result, it's consequential, right? So because of these bonds, they are then able to cling and climb on almost any surface. So D as a result. In November 1934, Amrita Sharagil was living in what must have seemed like the ideal city for a young artist. Paris, she was studying firsthand the color-saturated style of Francis' modernist masters and was beginning to make a name for herself as a painter. And then a transition, a uh, long return to her loved child home of India. So this is some sort of uh, contrast, right? She's moving. Only there, she believed, could she truly flourish. We have therefore, it's not any sort of causal or consequential thing. Um, indeed, wouldn't make sense. Furthermore, we're not adding on. It would be still, still can be used kind of like a contrast. Um, and in this case, it is. So our answer there would have to be A. Before California's 1911 election to approve a proposition granting women the right to vote, activists across the state sold tea to promote the cause of suffrage. In San Francisco, the Women's Suffrage Party sold equality at local fairs. And then we need a transition. In Los Angeles, activist Nancy Tuttle Gregg, who ran one of California's largest grocery stores, distributed vote uh, for women's votes for women's tea. All right, so in this case, we're just kind of adding on. So we've got, uh, for example, to conclude, similarly, this is similar to what came before as far as selling tea. Uh, so our answer there would have to be C. We're not in other words or anything like that. While researching a topic, a student has taken the following notes. Saiken Tunnel is a rail tunnel in Japan. It connects uh, this island to this island, roughly 33 miles long. It's a rail tunnel in Europe. Um, this is a different tunnel. Chanel Tunnel is a rail tunnel in Europe. It connects uh, Folkestone, England, and another place in France. It's about 31 miles long. So we have different lengths, different locations for these two. A student wants to compare the lengths of the two rails. Which cho choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal? Uh, so we need to focus on comparing the lengths. We have some of the world's largest are some of the world's rail tunnels, including one tunnel that extends from England uh, to France. That's only talking about one of them. Look at this next one. Uh, second tunnel is roughly 33 miles long, while the slightly shorter Chanel tunnel is about 31 miles long. Uh, we'll check if that's accurate in a minute. Um, we've got C. Saiken Tunnel, which is roughly 33 miles long, connects to Japanese. That one doesn't talk about the other one. We need to compare them. Both uh, are located, uh, both the Saiken Tunnel, which is located in Japan, and the Chanel Tunnel, which is located in Europe, are examples of rail tunnels. Okay, that one doesn't cover it either. B has to be right. We can quickly check the miles and just make sure they are, but uh, it's going to be 33 for Saiken. We see it is. Other one's 31, so B's got to be our answer there. While researching a topic, a student has taken the following notes. John Ching, a Los Angeles-based painter, uh, he uses the term flana to describe plant animal hybrids that he depicts in his surreal paintings. Flana is a combination of the words flora and fauna. His painting Nectar uh, depicts a parrot with leaves for feathers. His painting Primaveral depicts a snow leopard whose fur sprouts flowers. The student wants to provide an explanation, an example of flana, which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal. We have option A. Uh, the term flana used by Los Angeles-based painters, a combination of the words flora and flana. We want to be more descriptive than just defining it. We've got option B. We've got John Ching uses the term flana, a combination of the words flora and fauna to describe the subjects of his surreal paintings, plant animal hybrids, such as a parrot with leaves for feathers. That looks pretty good. It provides an explanation and an example with his uh, surreal paintings, uh, such as a parrot. Yes, that's an example right there. Um, it would be better though if we can get an example that's just talking about one of the specific works mentioned. We got option C. Uh, John Ching, who created Nectar, refers to the subjects of his painting as flana. No, we need more description on what flana is or explanation. We got D. Subjects of Nectar and Primavera are types of flana, a term that the painting's creator, John Ching, uses when describing his surreal artworks. Um, is that an explanation of flana? Not really. Uh, if we look at, we need an example of flana. Uh, I think this is probably the best, right? We give the explanation of what it is. And then for the example, we say such as a parrot with leaves for feathers. So B would be our best answer there. The problem with D is that it doesn't really explain what flana is. While researching a topic, a student has taken the following notes. In the midst of the U.S. Civil War, Susie Taylor escaped slavery and fled to Union Army occupied St. Simon's Island off the Georgia coast. She began working for an all-black army regiment as a nurse and teacher. In 1902, she published a book about the time she spent with the regiment. Her book was the only Civil War memoir to be published by a black woman. It is still available to readers in print and online the student wants to emphasize empath the student wants to emphasize the uniqueness of Taylor's accomplishment which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal I think the key thing here as far as um, emphasizing the uniqueness is that her book is the the only Civil War memoir to be published by a black woman that's probably gonna be the main focus if we look at our options we got a Taylor fled uh, to St Simon's Island, which was then occupied with the Union Army, Army for whom she began working. We need to look for something that's unique. So option B, after escaping slavery, Taylor began working for an all-black army regiment as a nurse and teacher. C, the book Taylor wrote about the time she spent with the regiment is still available 
uh, to readers in print and online. And then D, Taylor was the only black woman to publish a Civil War memoir. Yeah, we need to focus on the fact that we have to find which choice shows the uniqueness of her accomplishment. And that's answer choice D. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and consider sending a super thanks to help support my channel. Additionally, please drop a comment below letting me know what videos you want me to make in the future. And if you are looking for additional educational services that I offer, please check out my website, HaydenRody.com.